Dear brothers and sisters, respected elders, we have come to the interactive part of our program, the question and answer session. In this question and answer session, in order for us to adequately go into this topic, we study the topic properly, we would like the following rulings to be observed. The ruling number one is this. Questions asked must be on the topic itself, which is universal brotherhood. Any questions outside of the topic would not be entertained. Thirdly, whatever questions you have, post your question directly. Do not give mini lecture. Go direct to the point. If you want to give lecture, maybe you can organize another program and we will come to your program. <laughs> Fourth, you may ask only one question at a time. But you may have more than one question. What you need to do is to go back into the queue, go behind the queue and wait for your next turn. Non-Muslims, brothers and sisters, you will be given preference to ask questions. If there is a queue in front of you, Muslims, if you are a non-Muslim, we will give priority to you to even break the queue to come to the front. We would first exhaust whatever questions our brothers and sisters from other faith may have. And later, if time remains, then we give the opportunity to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Is that okay? Alhamdulillah. There are four mics located in this auditorium for your convenience to ask the question. Mic one is for the brothers to ask question. Mic two is for the sisters. And we have mic three on the first floor for the brothers to ask. And also mic four for the sisters area. We will take questions from mic one, mic two, mic three, mic four, and we will come back to mic one again. Before you post your question, please state your name and your profession so the speaker can give you a relevant answer to your question. And I will request my brothers and sisters, especially my brothers and sisters from other faith, in order not to waste time for people to come to the mic one by one, I will request you to have a queue. If you have any question, just come forward, put a queue, and we will start taking your questions. Can we have question from mic one, please? My name is Das, Anthony Das, and I am a trainer by profession. My question is like this. Doctor mentioned about universal brotherhood, and doctor also mentioned that the similarities, uh, the way we see God. Uh, he mentioned various religion. I, I would just like to ask this. Will it be okay for people of a different faith, let's say Christians. Can Christians uh, refer to the, the, their gods or the God as uh, Allah? Brother asked a very good question. That can people of other faith refer to their God as Allah? The answer was given in my lecture that if the God who you call as Allah fits in this four line definition, you can refer, otherwise, you can't. 
and I gave you a sample, a test, that there are some human beings in the world who call Bhagavan Rajneesh to be God. Now, when you put Bhagavan Rajneesh to the test of Surya class, it fails. So if you call Bhagavan Rajneesh as Allah, it is totally wrong. The same way the God you are worshipping. Which God do you worship as? I am from the Christian faith. According to Christian faith, I am a student of compared religion. I know what Bible says. I have studied the Bible. I can quote the Bible from my mind. I am asking you, who do you believe to be God? The creator of earth. Is creator no problem. But do you believe Jesus to be God? Jesus is the son of God. Son of God. If God has son, then he is not God. <laughs> then... Bible has got sons by the tons. If you read the Bible, Adam was son of God, Ephraim was son of God, Israel was son of God. All those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. In that idiom, anyone who followed the commandment of God is a godly person. In that way, I've got no problem. In Hindi, we say, Beta is around. So, no problem, Beta. But if someone says, Janava Beta, that means he's insinuating. So, only calling son of God is a good word. But if you say, Begotten son, do you believe Jesus is begotten son? Jesus is the son of God. The son of God, even Ephraim is son of God, Israel is son of God. So do you mean that Ephraim and Israel is same as Jesus, peace be upon him? I think uh, it would not be fair to question in that manner, because if you were to see Christianity from a Christian point of view... Not Christian point of view, I okay. see Christianity according to Bible point of view. Okay, if, you want to, biblical... if you want to understand any religion, Go to the scriptures. If you want to understand Islam, don't look at me. Don't look at Muslims. You analyze the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. If you want to understand Christianity, you have to study the Bible. If I have to understand Hinduism, I have to study the Vedas and the other scriptures. So what you have to know that as a student of comparative religion, I'm a student of comparative religion. I've studied the Bible. I've studied the Vedas. I've studied the Quran. And we have question and cessation for people to correct us. If you disagree with me, you have a right to disagree, but you have to tell me why. So, so I've given the talk here, and I know the concept of God according to Bible very well. I'm not bothered what the church says, because for me, Bible is important, not the church. So similarly, as far as the question is concerned, you can call the God you worship as Allah if your God fits in this four-line definition. So in this four-line definition, even though know, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, does not fit, and even Jesus Christ, peace be upon his father does not fit because God cannot have son. So both of them you cannot call as God. Hope that answers the question. So doctor, you disqualify Christians from calling Allah simply because of the fact that Christians believe that Jesus is the son of God. So that's the reason. If he is the son of God, begotten son, I disqualify. Because this statement, what you say son of God, is referring to your Bible, Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. I'm quoting. And you know that very well. Gospel of John chapter number 3 verse number 16 says, God soul of the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him shall not die but have everlasting life. Uh, You're fine. Doctor, the way you are seem to be answering my question, the spirit you are answering my question, uh, the essence you are answering my question, doesn't seem to be promoting this brotherhood between you and me. It is putting a separation between you Correct, and me. Because if you go against the Bible, I will separate from you. <laughs> if you are towards the Bible, I'm with you. Anyone, any human being who wants to create disharmony because he's going away from a scripture, I will not agree with him. Because you are going away from the scripture and going towards your church. I'm saying go back to your Bible. You quote the Bible. I'm giving references. What you are saying is that out of your own mind. Now, if you try and take the Christian away from the Bible, I will not agree with you. You quote the Bible and you quote the verses what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, spoke. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he said, worship me. And I told you, if any Christian, anyone in KL or in Malaysia or anywhere in the world shows me from any version of the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says, that I am God, or where he says, worship me, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, am ready to accept Christianity. <laughs> if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. <laughs> Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Gospel of John, he was circumcised on the eighth day. Brother, are you circumcised? No, I'm not. I'm circumcised. So I'm following the teachings of Jesus Christ or you? 
If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18. Don't have alcohol. It's mentioned in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1, that do not be drunk with wine. Brother, do you have alcohol? I don't. I have never tasted alcohol in my lifetime. Uh, but the Christian as a whole have or not? Say again? The Christian have as a whole or not? I haven't. I'm asking the Christians as a whole. I haven't. The Christian <laughs> as a whole. Do they have I or not? I haven't. I would not want to speak for other Christians. Fine. You don't have. Or do you have pork? Say again? Do you have pork? Yes, I have. Okay, now I'm quoting you. If you read the Old Testament, if you read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse number 2 to 5, in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, it says you should not have pork. I don't have pork, you have pork. If Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. I am promoting communal harmony. I am quoting a Bible, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, if you break one jot or tittle from the Old Testament, you shall never go to paradise. One law, if you break off the Old Testament, you shall not go to paradise. I am more Christian than the Christian themselves. I can go on and on. I can go on and on talking about the similarities. There are differences. I am not here to talk about difference. I am talking similarities. But the problem is, if you say Bible is the word of God, why aren't you following the commandments of the Bible? Why? So this is the problem with the followers, that when they want to follow the scripture, what my solution is, simple solution. One simple solution. I tell that at least believe that one book is the word of God. So Christian would not mind, okay, fine, I agree, Bible is the word of God. The Hindu will say, I don't mind believing Veda to be the word of God. And the Muslim will say, I don't mind believing Quran to be the word of God. I tell them, let us agree to follow what is common in all these three scriptures. What is different, we'll discuss tomorrow. Right or wrong, we'll discuss tomorrow. Let us agree today that let us follow 100% what is common in all these three scriptures. As I told in my lecture, that all these scriptures talk about one God. This God has got no images. He has got no picture, no portrait, no father, no mother. I have given quotations from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. I have given quotations from the Old Testament, New Testament, from the Vedas, from the Quran. Point number one. Let us agree there is one God. Worship Him alone, not Trinity. Not triune God, one God. Next, I had given the talk yesterday in Jawabaro. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the major world religious scriptures. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not only mentioned in the Quran, he's prophesied in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Hindu scriptures, in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, in the Puranas. He prophesies in the Parsi scriptures, in the Buddhist scriptures. Let us agree to believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. So easy. All the scriptures say don't have alcohol. Bible says don't have alcohol. Quran says don't have alcohol. The Hindu scripture, Manu Smithi says don't have alcohol. Let's stop having alcohol. So easy. Bible says do hijab. All the ladies should do hijab. They should cover their head. Only you see nuns and Mother Mary. You know Mother Mary? Mother Mary, her photograph is just like a Muslima. Properly covered. But when you see the other ladies, no. If you read the first Corinthians, first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 and 6, it says if the woman that does not cover her head, she dishonors the head, her head should be shaved off. Even in Islam, in Quran, it doesn't say that the woman who uncovers the head should be shaved off. This is how strict the Bible is for the woman to cover her head. But most of the Christian women, we see the heads uncovered. So I'm trying to get communal harmony, not discord. So please don't come here and say things which are wrong. Say again. Please don't come and lay allegation against me. I'm bringing co-relationship. I am bringing communal harmony. That's a different thing that you want to go away from your Bible. I want to get you closer to your Bible. Thank you. Now, it, now, I feel that it is not fair just because you follow certain things in the Bible, you become more Christian than Christians. I follow a lot of things which is also in the Muslim faith. And I know a lot of things the Muslims themselves don't follow in the Muslim faith. I'm sure you would agree with me. But would that make me more Muslim than Muslims? There is not a single statement you can give in the Quran as a whole. Not you may be better than one individual Muslim. He is a namesake Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. If he says he submits and he does not submit, he's a pseudo-Muslim. He will not go to Jannah. He will not go to Jannah. 
just by saying that I'm a Muslim will not take him to paradise. I will openly say that. Unlike in your Christianity, that you believe Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for your sins according to your church, and you go to heaven. That's not part of the Bible. That's the teaching of the church. So I'm here to promote communal harmony, to let people know. And what I'm telling is quotation directly. You tell me what is common. You tell me one thing in the Quran which I don't follow. Show me I one can, thing. Tell I me can, one thing. One I, thing I in the Quran. Some, I can see something common in what both of us are saying. Sorry? One, I can see something common. There are many things common, yes. not something common. I can see something common. I can see. I can see. I didn't say you can see. I said that I can, I can see something common in what both of us are seeing. There are many. I can see that there are some Christians who do not follow Christianity as, as well as they should. And I can see there are some Muslims who do not follow what Islam teaches as they should. Not some Christians. According to statistics, majority Christians don't follow. According to statistics today, there are 7 billion people in the world. The people who profess the Christian faith, they may be close to 2 billion. The people that okay. profess the Islamic faith, more than 1.5 billion. But the people who follow, the majority in the world are Muslims. Majority. The Christians, they, they, they don't follow. So as a whole, the religion, we have black sheep in our community. But as a whole, the religion which is maximum followed, the teaching of any religion that is Islam. I know there are black sheep in the community. There are many black sheep. But as a whole, as a percentage, today's statistics tell us the religion which is maximum followed the teachings based on the Quran, on the scripture, is number one Islam. That's the reason today the fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. Brother, what's your, if you have any question, uh, yes, you can brother. pose a question or go behind the queue. Yes, brother. Pose your question. Shall I? Okay. I just like to end by saying, I would like to say that, okay, I rephrase. There are some Christians who are not following the Christian doctrine. There are some Muslims who do not follow the Muslim doctrine. I would add like, end by saying, however, I would not want to boost my ego by saying, I am more Muslim than Muslims. Thank you, sir. Brother said there are some Christians who don't follow. Not some Christian. Majority people who claim to be Christians are not following the Bible according to statistics. And I do agree that there are some Muslims who are black sheep who are not following. Those who don't follow the scripture, those who go against the Quran, they are not true Muslims. They may be part or they may be pseudo. But you can never say, never ever can you say, until you accept that there is one God. And Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. You can never claim to be better than the Muslims. Can we have the next question from this mic? My name is Tina. Um, I'm a pharmacy student and I'm a Hindu. Dr. Zake, I just want to ask, you're from India. I'm not so sure whether you're familiar with this um, practice in, among Indians, you know, um, regarding this leaf that you go and consult uh, someone. And if you manage to find your leaf, based on trumpet and other things like that, your whole life, your name, parents' name, uh, past, future, what's going to happen is all written in that leaf. I don't know whether this is a practice of Hinduism or is something made by the temples or people. And if so, if everything is already written, how is it comparing Hinduism or maybe this practice with Islam, um, faith and free will? Thank you. The sister posed the question that there may be certain practices in India about picking up leaf, which mentions about a future. There are different types of practices. It may not be part of the scripture, but there are different, different types, mainly talking about the future. Jyotish, you know, go to Jyotish, to a fortune teller. Go to a fortune teller, different types you see on the streets, there are many cards kept and a parrot goes and picks up a card and then they read and that talks about the future. You go to a machine, put your date of birth and the machine tells you something. Now, based on this, based on this, you go, it's very common and people make a fast buck out of it. I'll first tell you about it. There was a psychologist in States who taught a class of 100 students and at the end of a week, he said, I will tell you about your past to each student. 
and he wrote to each student separately. He gave them a chat. He said, don't open. You open together, and after you open, you tell me how accurate was I in my talking about your past. So all the students opened, and 95% of the students, they said that the professor was more than 90% correct. 5% said that he was 80% correct. The key to it was the professor wrote the same thing for everyone. For example, you go to a machine and give a birth date, and the machine will tell you something bad is going to happen in the next 10 days. Even if 100 good things happen, something bad will happen. The next person, the machine will say that something good is going to happen. Even if 100 bad things happen, something good will happen. So most of these things, talking about the future, it's a big fuss. Sorry, I just wanted to say because like my family, it's a thing to do this. So my leaf was found and they read it. So things in it like, because, you know, science students try to think logically, rational, whether it's possible. Because sometimes when some things they say, for example, this is your mother's name, they got it correct. This is your father's name, they got it correct. And I think it's in Sanskrit, so it's like you have to believe entirely what the guy is saying because you can't check it yourself, whether it's right or wrong. At, uh, I think I was 16 when I read it, so they said the age where you read it was 16. There's still like... Maybe out of 10 things, 8 things he got correct. And it's like sometimes I try to think, how do they do this? And it seems a lot of people also come. So it's like this logic and the faith, it's like a, it's, there's a fight there. Which should I believe? I'll just come to it, sister. Let me complete my answer. That will cover your question also. As I was saying, that most of the people that do is a big fast. It's a big gimmick just to make fast money. What Quran says, which I mentioned in my talk, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90. Ya ladin amanu, oh you believe in namal khamru or maisuru, most certainly intoxicates and gambling. Wala tabu al-azlamu, dedication of stone, divination of arrows, rich to minamili shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. First handiwork, alakum to flu'un. Abstain from the handiwork that you may prosper. Here, Quran says alcohol, gambling, fortune telling, and dedication of stone. Fortune telling is same. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Quran does not say that no one can predict the future. See, many Muslims don't realize what the Quran says. Alcohol, gambling, fortune telling, dedication of stones. These are Satan's and work abstain from it. Quran does not say no one can predict the future. But most of the people who predict the future, they are just doing a gimmick to make fast money out of it. Based on the Quran and the Hadith, we come to know that there are Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad that there are jinns who listen and they pass on the message to certain people. We as Muslims should not be involved in it. It is prohibited. But that does not mean no one can predict the future. Most of the people who claim are all wrong. But there may be certain human beings who can predict the future. But we as human beings should not indulge in it, whether it's right or wrong. It will be bad for us. So based on this, the Quran says you should not indulge in it. Quran does not say you cannot. There are many people who talk about palm reading. And there are times when some people are 50% correct, some people are 70% correct. If you put heads or tails, 50% will be right, sister. You know, heads or tails, 50% will be right. So, some people do it just by chance. There may be few, maybe a very small percentage who may have the art of knowing about the past. That is mentioned in the Hadith of Prophet Wasallam. But we as Muslims should not indulge in it. We should not indulge in black magic. We should not indulge in fortune telling. Why? It will cause us harm. So in this context, sister, we as Muslims are not allowed. There may be a very small percentage which may tell quite a major portion of your past or of your future. A very small portion. But we as Muslims are not allowed to indulge in it. That's a commandment. Like how we are not allowed to have alcohol, we aren't allowed to gamble. So indulging in it is not good, it is prohibited. The same thing I'll tell you that as a human being, if you agree that Quran is the word of God, the Quran does not allow a human being to indulge in it. It will be nothing but loss in the long run for you. Hope that answers the question, sister. Now, I mean, like, now once I've already seen it, I rather would have not seen it. But because now you know it, and then it's stuck here, it's a bit difficult sometimes when you want to just believe in fate or free will. And then in this context, do you believe that 
uh, we can still practice free will or is on fate? Our sister asked a question that if you know what is happening, then can you practice free will? As I told you, there's no one you can say who can 100% talk about the future. So even if, you're, like you said, out of 10 things, 8 are coming correct. You may never know the thing which hasn't come correct yet will come correct or not. So you yourself said 80% correct. So it may come, may not. So it's in the free will. As far as Islam is concerned, Islam, we have to believe in destiny, that is Qadr. It's one of the pillars of Iman that we Muslims should believe in Qadr in destiny. I will tell you what is destiny as far as Islam is concerned. That is clearly mentioned in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when a child is born, the father is wound on the neck. It's mentioned in the Quran. Everything what you're going to do, Allah knows. But that does not interfere with your free will. Allah has given a free will. For example, if a teacher is teaching in a classroom for one year, just before the final examination, the teacher predicts that this student, he will get first class. He'll come out first in the class. This student, he'll get second class. This student, he will fail. It's just an example, brother. Don't feel bad. <laughs> now, when the examination takes place, after the results out, this student comes out first class first, he gets second class, this student fails. Now, can the student who failed tell the teacher, because the teacher predicted I will fail, therefore I fail? Can he blame the teacher? Yes or no? No. Why? Because the teacher knew this student intelligent, used to do his homework, used to attend the class throughout the year, this student average, this student used to go for movies, play hooky, bunk school. So teacher predicted. Same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ilm gab. Now the difference between the teacher and Allah is the teacher as a human being can make a mistake. Can be right 99% but not 100%. Always Allah has ilm gab. He has knowledge of the future but he has given you a free will. For example, you come at a crossroad. There's road 1, 2, 3, 4. You can choose any. You choose road 2. So Allah knows in advance on this particular date, on the 29th of September, you will come at a crossroad. You will choose road 2. It is not because Allah has mentioned you will choose road to your choosing. It is because you will be choosing Allah road in advance. For example, after you pass standard 12, no, A levels, you can either become a doctor or engineer. You choose to become a doctor. So Allah knows in advance that after you pass your A levels, you will choose to become a doctor. Choice is yours. Not because Allah has written you have become a doctor, because you have chosen Allah road in advance. Now, once you have come at a crossroad, one, two, three, four, you have taken road two, you come at another crossroad, A, B, C, D, E. You choose road D. Allah knows in advance that when you come at the next crossroad, you will choose road D. So it is because you will be choosing Allah road. Otherwise, people will say, it's mentioned my takdeer. I will commit murder. I committed murder. Who's to blame? Allah is to blame, not me. If it's mentioned my destiny, I'm going to rob. I robbed. Who's to blame? Allah is to blame. Allah gave you the option that after you finish your college, you can either rob or earn by doing hard work. You choose to rob. So Allah knows after you finish your college, you could do hard work or you could rob. You choose to rob. So you can't blame Allah. Allah knows in advance. Allah is in my gap. So there is something like taqdeer, destiny in Islam, but Allah has given us a free will. Allah has given us a free will. We are responsible. Otherwise, then where is the test? And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good and deeds. This life sister is the test for the hereafter. So that's the reason Islam says don't indulge in fortune telling about the future now as you're saying something is always clicking here so you may think that he may have told you okay at the age of 30 you'll die so you may be thinking oh, i'm going to die you may not die so what if you have done a mistake forget it sister take it out you lead your normal life try and find out which is the truth what you have to do sister do a research do a research of various religious scriptures which is the true scripture that will give you serenity calmness Peace of mind. Read that scripture, follow it, and forget what the fortune teller has told you. Even if it comes out to be right, no problem. You do what you feel is right based on your research. That how to lead a life. So this Quran, sister, is the last and final guidance given by Almighty God to humanity. It's not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs or the Malay. 
it's meant for the whole of humanity and if you read this book inshallah you would get peace of mind i request the volunteer to gift you a copy of the english translation of the quran you read it inshallah it will give you peace of mind thank you Ramdan, the question. thank you we will come back to mic one i request the non-muslim brothers and sisters this is the opportunity to ask questions please feel free though the moderator said you have to ask questions on the topic for non-muslims there is a concession you can ask any question on comparative religion whether it be islam whether it be christianity whether it be hinduism whether it be on the topic outside the topic this is the opportunity normally after religious talk the person who gives the religious talk doesn't have open question answer session because if you have open question answer session the poll will open up you know so normally after religious talk you don't have open question answer session i like having open question and session and the question and session is better than the talk because it's a dialogue you know talk is a monologue one way talk it's a challenge for me also and you have a right to question me you have a right to disagree with me only tell me the reason if i'm at fault i will agree if not i will correct you you can even criticize the quran please feel free this is the opportunity normally you don't get such opportunities after religious talk where you can ask any question you can ask any question on compared religion. I request my non-Muslim brothers and sisters, please come to the microphone, make a cue, ask the question, something which is troubling you, maybe before you came here, which was troubling maybe two years back. This is the opportunity. I will try my level best. Even if you criticize Islam, I'm young, I can take it. So I've got white hair, but I'm young, mashallah. Yes, brother. Mundasya Janaya Slakaya Shakshu Mlitam in a Tasme, Sri Guru Venamaha, Kamkaru Tivachalam, Bangam Langa, I think Yakripa Tamaham and Sri Gudinata Rinam. My name is Chaitanya Haridas. Uh, by profession, I am a lecturer, but I also do uh, cross religious studies. Actually, I have prepared a question, but that question is not so relevant to the topic today. And because this question was is with me for many years, so, so I'm going to change the question that's relevant. Especially uh, respected Dr. Zakir, you have mentioned about the Vedas, the Upanishad and the, all the, uh, some of the Ishopanishad. But uh, I like to quote a quotation here from Srimad Bhagavatam, Kanto 3, chapter 11, text 35, in which it says, Purushaya Paracharya Brahma netra maham adbhuta kalpa yat bahama brahma sat brahmati yam viruhu The meaning is, in the beginning of the first half of uh, Brahma kalpa, where Lord Brahma appeared, then Brahma's life, there is a million called Brahma kalpa. The birth of Brahma, uh, the, the birth of Vedas was simultaneous with Brahma's birth. So here it mentioned that Lord Brahma takes birth after birth. And the Vedas appeared when he take a birth. So in a, based on the literatures, Lord Brahma's age, full age is 311 trillion and 40 billion years. And if we go in that calculation, I think many of us here are bewildered. But this is a quotation from Srimad Bhagavatam. Another thing, I, why I mention this, because uh, Dr. Zakir have mentioned that the Vedas says that the Lord don't have a form. But in the same way, that's also mentioned the Lord have a form. I quote another verse from Brahma Samhita, chapter 5, text number 1. It says, Ishwara Parama Krishna Sachit Ananda Vikraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarvakarnam Karnam Ishwara Parama Krishna. It says, the Supreme Personality of God, it, Krishna, is the Supreme Controller. Ishwara Parama Krishna. Sachit Ananda Vikraha. Sat means Sachit Ananda means eternal, blissful, and full of knowledge. So he said, Sachit Ananda Vigraha. Vigraha refers to the form, a transcendental form which is given in the Vedas. I think uh, when we do a research on the uh, particular scriptures, I prefer that we have a whole idea that the Vedas also mention about the, the form. And I have many other quotes which says that the, the Lord has been realized in different forms. Which Veda are you quoting, brother? 
This is Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is not part of the Veda. Veda is the four. Rig Ved, Yajur Ved, Sam Ved, Atharva Ved. Yes, I agree with that. Right? But the Brahma Samhita is yes. the That's commentary it. by Brahma. Uh, don't go commentary, quote the text. If you follow the commentary of the Quran, the commentary of Quran is written by human beings. You quote the text. As far as Vedas are concerned, there were many Vedas. Today, there's Rig Ved, Yajur Ved, Sam Ved, Atharva Ved. Yes, that we also there have four Vedas. Puran, eight, we have also added Puranas, 108 Upanishads, 108 Isho Upanishads. Whether you ask the question, let me and reply. And we have You ask the question, let me reply. Okay. As far as the Hindu scriptures are concerned, the Hindu scriptures are divided into two types, Shrutis and Smriti. Shruti is considered to be the word of God, revelation from God. In it, you have the Vedas, you have the Upanishads. Then you have the Smriti. Smriti is considered to be written by human beings. There, you have the Ithyas, Ramayana, Mahabharat, Bhagavad Gita as part of Mahabharat. Then you have the Manu Smriti. So between the two scriptures, the Shruti is superior than the Smriti. If there is a clash between the Shruti and the Smriti, you have to follow the Shruti, not the Smriti. Because Shruti is higher. Same way with the Quran. We have the Quran, then we have the Hadith. If there is a Hadith which is not Sahih, it clashes with the Quran, then we keep the Hadith aside. What we have to believe in Quran and the Sahih Hadith, authentic saying of Prophet Muhammad There are certain things which people have manipulated. So when such manipulated hadith comes, what we do? We reject it. So now I am quoting you, Veda, Veda is the highest. No Shpriti can go against the Veda. If it goes against the Veda, we reject the Shpriti. We follow the Shruti. This I am talking from Hindu scholars. As far as the Vedas are concerned, the Vedas speak if you read Dayanand Saraswati, the founder of Arya Samaj. Correct? In the Vedas, it only talks about God who has got no image. I know there are other scriptures like Manu Smriti and Itihas in which it talks about God having image. But a lower scripture cannot overrule a higher scripture. When there is a conflict, you have to follow the higher scripture. That's the reason I have quoted you Veda. So if you get me a quotation from any book which is a Smriti, it cannot overrule the Shruti. Point number one. Point number two, even if you get me quotation, if there's a contradiction in the Veda, then why follow a book which has contradiction? You take out one contradiction in the Quran. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 82. al Quran. Wala min in the fiktilafan kasira. Do they not consider the Quran with care that if there were contradictions in it, it would never be from God? If there is a contradiction, then that book is not the word of God. Do you understand? So we as students of comparative religion, what we have to do, I am here to talk about similarities. I know there are many things which are differences in Quran and the Bible, Quran and the Veda. I am here to promote peace and harmony, not animosity. Therefore, Quran says, come to common terms as between us and you. I know there are many things which I don't agree with the Veda. I'm not going to tell you about that. Why? Because that will create animosity. So my thing, what I told you, let us agree to follow what is common. What is different, we'll discuss tomorrow. So let you and I agree, if you consider Veda to be word of God, I consider Quran to be the word of God, let us agree to follow what is common. What is common is 100% the word of God according to you and me. But if you selectively don't follow passages of your scriptures, why be selective? You tell me anything from the Quran, which I don't follow, I will say sorry and I'll start following. I don't claim to be a very 100% Muslim, but Alhamdulillah, as far as what's my capacity, I and try and follow everything of the Quran. You point out a single verse in the Quran, whether you believe the Quran is the word of God or not. You point out a verse and inshallah I'll follow. The same way when I'm doing the same thing with the Bible, with the Vedas, if the Christian believes the Bible to be the word of God, if the Hindus believe Veda to be the word of God, you have to follow. I know there are contradictions, but I'm not here to talk about the negative point of the scripture. I challenge anyone to point out a single contradiction in the Quran. There is none. As far as the age, of the Veda is concerned. According to Swami Dhyanil Saraswati, the Veda is 1310 million years old. But the majority of the scholars today of Hinduism say the Veda is approximately 4000 years old. Today the scholars say we don't know to whom the Veda was revealed, in which part of the world it came. 
There are differences. Quran, everything is authentic. Yet the scholars believe, even though we don't know what is the exact age of the Veda, even though we don't know where and which part of the world it came the first time, even though we don't know which stage it came to, yet the Hindus as a whole, they believe Veda to be the most sacred. Because they believe, I respect it. I may not agree everything of it. Because I respect, I try and take out the commonalities. So as I told you, Vedas talk about Natasipati Masti. Of that God, there are no images. Upanishads talk about that. Vedas talk about that. So if you get me a scripture which is lower, does not contradict, it cannot overrule the Vedas. And if you tell me that there are verses in the Veda talking about, then there's a contradiction. So you as a Hindu, you have to try and find out why this contradiction is it. No book of Almighty God, if it's in its true form, can have any contradiction. Same thing, we believe. Quran mentions Injil, the Wahi which was given to Isa is the word of God. But the present Bible, I can point out hundreds of contradictions. I don't want to do it. I know I'm a student of compared religion. So what I say, the present Bible is not 100% the word of God. It's a mixture. It contains the word of God. It even contains the word of the prophets. It even contains the word of the historians. It even contains pornography. I'm sorry to say that. It contains obscene things. So me, as a student of comparative religion, I'm not here to criticize the Bible. I'm talking about commonality. Let's come to common terms. If I try and criticize, that will bring animosity. There are certain passages of the Bible I cannot read to you. Even if you give me a million dollars, I cannot read. Even if you give me a million US dollars to me and say, read this passage in front of the audience, I cannot. Because my religion doesn't allow to read obscene things in front of the audience. You understand, no? But I'm not here to degrade the Bible. I'm talking about common things. Same thing with the Hindu scripture. As far as the Quran is concerned, the language of the Quran is so sublime. You can read anywhere in the world. You can read to your wife, you can read to your children, you can read to your father. But certain passages of the Bible, I cannot. So here, brother, I've come for communal harmony. And based on that, I have done research on the Hindu scriptures, on the Jewish scriptures, on the Christian scriptures. Unfortunately, People of most of the religions, they blindly follow what is mentioned by the church, what is mentioned by the temple. What we have to do is we have to ask them for proof. So that's the reason what Dr. Zakir Naik says in Islam is zero. Chapter number, verse number. If I say alcohol is prohibited, carries no weight. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, alcohol is prohibited. So based on this, brother, I am trying to get the Hindus, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims together to come on a common platform and at least agree to follow what is common in the scriptures so that universal brother will increase. Hope that answers the question. But Dr. Zaki, I think you are limiting the knowledge that is in the Vedas. Vedas contain all the knowledge. That is what Vedas mean. So if you say, I only take the Smriti, not the Smriti, so that is limiting because in the uh, the way that we are taught, okay, we are, I'm saying, there's not one word in the Veda say Hinduism. So, but always we'll talk about Hinduism. Hinduism comes in the few thousand years ago. Only word there is Sanatan Dharma. So, okay, I'm I'll referring come to, to See, you're asking Dharma. question, I'll reply, but every question requires an answer which takes a few minutes. I'm not saying don't follow Smriti, but if there's a contradiction between the Smriti and the Shruti, the Shruti carries more weight. For example, you go to a doctor who's a specialist, heart specialist, who's done BM in cardiology, and a general physician, MBBS, who's talking about heart. Who will you believe? Suppose the mother has a heart attack. After MBBS, MD. After MD is DM. He's DM in cardiology. Will you follow him or will you follow MBBS doctor for heart specialty? Suppose the mother has a heart attack. Who will you follow? The one I have faith with. Sorry? One you have faith with. Who will have faith more as a logical person? A DM of heart speciality or MBBS doctor? Even though a person can have higher uh, No, not knowledge. can. If you don't know both Even of them. I have knowledge. Maybe he is not experienced. But you have two people. You have come first time to a country and one has DM, one has MBBS. Who will you take your mother to? The one who have a D. Correct. So similarly, when there is a contradiction between Shruti and Smriti, you have to follow Shruti, that's what the Hindu scholars say, not I. Anywhere in the world. So you have to tell Hindu scholars are wrong. Now, now, coming, coming to your word. See, every time you're asking a new thing, I have to clarify. You said the word Hinduism is not there in the Hindu scriptures, correct. 
Jawaharlal Nehru, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, in his book Discovery of India, he says the word Hinduism is not there in any Indian literature until the Arabs came to India. This word Hindu was given by the Arabs. The Arabs gave the word Hindu to the people who live in the land of the Indus. Even today when I go to Saudi, they call me Hindi, Hindi, Hindi. So Hindu is a geographical definition. The word Hindu was given by the Arabs. People living in the land of Indus. So Hindu is a geographical definition for the people living in the land of the Indus Valley. By geographical definition, I'm a Hindu. By geographical definition, I'm a Hindu and a Muslim. Indian Muslim, Hindu Muslim. But if you say Hindu, means those who believe in worshipping idols, then I'm not a Hindu. According to Swami Vivekananda, Hinduism is a misnomer. The right word should be Vedantist. Because they follow the Vedas. Hinduism is a misnomer. It was a word, a title given by the Arabs when they came to India. And today also it's Agastakon. Even today when I go to Saudi, they call me Hindi, Hindi. Yes, I'm a Hindi. And I'm proud to be a Hindi. But I don't believe in doing idol worship. So coming to Hinduism, this is a misnomer. The right word is Vedantist or can be Sanatartham. I agree with you. And Sanatartham believe that God is one and God has got no images. Show me one person who is a pure follower of Sanatardham who says that God has got image. That means you have not studied Sanatardham. Have you studied Sanatardham? I am still studying. That's why I say... Still studying, is, yeah. yeah. You are yet studying. Is, uh, you have not passed MBBS also yet. You have not passed MBBS also. Quran says, Quran says in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse 43 and Surah Ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 7 Fas alu ahal zikri in kuntula ta'ala moon. If you don't know, ask the person who is an expert. So I hope that answers the question. Brother, you can, for next question, you can go behind the queue, behind the other non-Muslims. Thank you, brother. We will move to this side of the mic. Uh, my name is Shah. I'm a psychology student. Okay, previously, doctor mentioned that Allah is God, and not just for the Muslims, but also for the non-Muslims, for the blacks, for the whites, as doctor quoted earlier. So, uh, okay. I can accept that Allah is God for everybody. But there was an incident a few years ago uh, on this date called September 11, when there were two towers which were filled with... Um, I would presume that they were of the Christian faith, these American citizens. And these two towers were knocked down by an aeroplane which was hijacked and controlled by, from what I have heard, uh, controlled by Muslims. So, in that sense, what I see is that the brother is killing the brother. And uh, I just want to know what doctor has to say about that. <laughs> Very good question. Referring to 9-11, September 11, just, just passed away a couple of weeks back, that the Twin Tower was there, it was knocked down by a plane, there were majority Christian in it, knocked down what she heard, and she's very clear, mashallah. She heard that Muslim controlled the plane. Sister, till now, it's only a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that Muslims were there, it was 19 Arabs who hijacked the plane, and they banged on the Twin Towers. According to 75 scientists, American, all of them Christian, According to 75 American scientists and professors, if you have seen the documentary Loose Change, no, Loose Change is a documentary made by a young American. He takes interviews and these 75 scientists and professors say that we cannot ever believe that 19 Arabs can hijack a plane and knock into the Twin Towers. It is an inside job done by the White House. White House, you know White House. Now, I hear everything. I'm hearing from the news, Arabs have done it. I'm hearing from news that Muslims have done it. They found the passport of an Arab in the plane crash, which burned the pillars and all the iron rods, but did not burn the passport of the Arab. So someone wrote that next time they should make the army suit of the Americans in their passport material. <laughs> I've given a full lecture on its terrorism Muslim monopoly. It is so effective. My lecture is so effective that the Westerners don't want me in the country today. <laughs> the 
my lecture is so effective, so logical. These people, these Americans, I'm quoting, huh? I'm only giving you statistics that they had an interview with the person who made the Twin Towers. He said that it's impossible that the fuel of the plane can melt the Twin Tower. And if you see the photograph, it was the Twin Tower came in stages as though there were bombs planted in advance. There are many hypotheses. For example, there's a boy who's speaking on the mobile. Mother, mother, I am Mark Binham. I am Mark Binham speaking. Point to be noted at that time in 9-11, 2001, more than 10 years back, mobile could not reach that level. Point number one. Point number two, when a son speaks to the mother, why will he say Mark Binang? When I will speak to my mother, I'll say Zakir. I'll not say I'm Zakir Naik speaking. <laughs> when I speak to my mother, I'll say I'm Zakir. I'll not say Zakir Naik. So what you realize, they are trying to make a story and blame. And that person on the mobile told the mother that it was Muslims. So all these documentaries you see, Loose Chain, Fahrenheit, many documentaries. If you ask me who did it, I would say I don't know. But as a logical person, the logical proof of loose change is much more logical than the proof given to me by the American government. And then they want to attack Afghanistan. Afghanistan gives me proof, they want to give proof to Musharraf. Why? And I speak so openly, Westerners believe in freedom of people, but they don't like my talk. So what they do, they prevent me to enter in the country. I'm telling you, let's have a dialogue. As far as the question is concerned, who did it keep it aside? I know that there were more than 3,000 human beings who were killed in Twin Towers. If you want the Islamic answer, as I mentioned in my talk, as per Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though it has killed all of humanity. So whoever did the Twin Towers, whoever did it, whether it was inside job, whether the American did or Muslim did, whoever did it, it is wrong. Prohibited, haram, I condemn it. <laughs> you tell Muslim did, I, I don't know. Whoever did it, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, American, X, Y, Z, whoever did, more than 3,000 Americans were killed. Even if there were non-Americans in it, it is a haram. I also go on to say, more than 50 people were killed in the tube blast of London. In London tube blast, some say 52, some say 54. So I say more than 50. When more than 50 people were killed, I condemn it. In Bombay, where there were trained bomb blast in 2006, more than 180 people were killed. I condemn it. But I don't put a full stop there. I also say that I condemn the thousands of innocent people killed in Afghanistan, in Palestine, in Iraq. Now coming to the secret, coming to the secret. No, I condemn 3,000 Americans killed, everyone is happy. I condemn more than 50 people killed in London tube blast, everyone is happy. I condemn more than 180 people killed in Bombay, everyone is happy. But when I say I condemn the thousands of innocent people killed in Afghanistan, in Iraq and Palestine, the Home Secretary of UK doesn't like it, so she bans me. <laughs> Freedom of speech. When you want to criticize the prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, freedom of speech. And I said, I condemn the innocent people killed in Afghanistan. No, I'm careful, you know, because I'm a debater. Because if I say thousands of people killed in Afghanistan, they say, oh, Zakir is supporting terrorists in Afghanistan. So I'm going out of my way to say thousands of innocent people killed in Afghanistan. They may be terrorists, Allah Alam, I don't know. So I'm so careful. When I said America, I didn't say innocent Americans. As any American you kill, I condemn in the Twin Towers, in the London bomb blast, in the Bombay bomb blast. But in Afghanistan, I said, innocent, so it doesn't go down the throat. You know why? Because Zakir gets large audiences, no? Today, the media wants to malign Islam. But if they have a person who's clarifying the picture of Islam, they want to ban him. Let's have a dialogue, come to common terms. So as far as killing innocent people, sister, whoever did it is to be condemned. But don't follow the media. The media today is the most powerful weapon in the world. It can convert black into white, can convert day into night, hero into a villain, villain into a hero.
that's why I said doctor from what I have heard. I agree. Your question was very I'm good. I'm not sure. You're not you, sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, do, not, I don't think anybody. I thank is, you. You're not like the American. Very good. And neither are you like the. <laughs> thank you. Thank neither you. Neither are you like the Home Secretary of UK. Your question was very clear, and my answer is clear. Whoever did it, it is wrong. Killing any innocent people. And just one more, I like to give an incidents. When I gave a talk in Bombay on is there in the Muslim monopoly, I gave a talk. After the train bomb blast, the police of Bombay told me, Zakir, you're popular among the Muslims, I don't give a talk. And the Muslims said, oh, the only Zakir is truthful, he can talk to the police. So I was on the edge of the sword, both are telling me to give a talk. Bakra mil gaya. And I told that, while I was guiding even the police and the Muslim ummah, that when you have a doubt about a Muslim and you arrest a few, no problem, you are rounding up 3,000 Muslims just to catch few terrorists. Whether you catch those five, ten terrorists or not, you're creating another hundred terrorists. If you really have doubt and proof regarding few Muslims, catch, we will cooperate with you. But in mass, you're catching Muslim youngsters. And few years back, before 2006, in the early part of 2000, there was a genocide, a massacre of the Muslims in Gujarat. Thousands of Muslims were killed, thousands of Muslim women were raped. And in retaliation, that's what the media says, inverted commas, retaliation. There was bomb blast in Bombay. So one Hindu gets up and tells me, Dr. Zakir Naik, if I would have been in the place of a Muslim, and if thousands of Muslims were killed, and if my mother was raped, I would do the same thing what the Muslims have done here. And the people started to clap. I said, brother, what you're behaving is like a normal human being, emotional. I agree with you. Normal. But I, the Muslim, cannot do that. Because my religion does not permit me to do that. My religion does not permit me to kill a single innocent human being. Even if some Hindus in Gujarat have killed Muslims, it does not give me permission to kill an innocent Hindu living in Bombay. I cannot do it. I know you're emotional, even I have emotion. But I cannot follow my emotion because my Quran does not permit me. It does not permit me. If I catch the culprit in Gujarat and give him to the law and punish him, no problem. But retaliating by killing an innocent human being in Bombay, imagine the family of that person, innocent person who's killed, will 100% always be enemy of Islam. I'm here to spread peace. So in Islam, you cannot get emotional and go against the law of the Creator. The law of the Creator is very clear that you cannot kill any innocent human being. If you kill even one innocent human being, it's as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you save one innocent human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. Hope that answers the question. Sir. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the next question from the mic? Hi, um, my name is Shanice and I'm a student uh, studying business. I'm actually curious about LGBT, which refers to the community of lesbians, gays, uh, bisexuals, and transsexuals. So what Islam's point of view of this uh, issue? Because uh, I used to believe that we have to accept people regardless of their sexual orientation. So after I study some information about Islam, I know that Islam rejects this. So I want to know further about this issue. Thank you. Sister, that was the question of what is the Islamic view on homosexuals, on gays and lesbians. The ruling is that Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 81, do you prefer men in preference to women? That means telling to men that do you prefer men rather than women? Homosexuality is prohibited in Islam. Regarding, what about people who are homosexual? There's an article that came a few years back, homosexuality is genetic. And when this article came, people asked me in the question and session, if homosexuality is genetic, then who's to blame? The person is not to blame. It is Almighty God, correct? Later on, it was found that this is totally false. And the person who propounded this, he himself was a homosexual. What today psychologists tell us, that when a person goes beyond the limit, he keeps on wanting things which is unnatural. So today you see in the Western world, there is obscenity. Like my son said, the woman's talk of liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of body, deprivation of a soul, and degradation of honor. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman had degraded her to concubine. 
to mysticism and society butterflies which are hidden behind the colorful skin of art and culture. In today's society, you have advertisement. In a motorbike advertisement, invariably there's a woman. Now, how many women ride motorcycles? Percentage by it? but you see a woman in that, why? And I was told of a very famous ad of BMW. I was told, in front of the BMW car, a woman is standing in a bikini, and the ad reads, test drive her now, who, the girl or the car? So they're selling their daughters, they're selling their mothers, and they're saying that women are liberated. What happens is that when you go beyond limits, all religions say that if you want to have relationship, you marry. Correct? According to American statistics, America doesn't agree in Islam. Islam says you can have more than one wife, that's a different question. In America, the American statistics tell us an average American, before he settles down with a permanent life partner, he has eight different sexual partners. Some may be having two, ten, twenty, average is eight. Eight different sexual partners before they settle down with one. So they are disregarding the law of the Creator. Do you know, according to American statistics, every 12th person you meet has committed incest. Incest means having sexual relationship, brother and sister, son and mother, father and daughter. It's absolutely nonsense. Because they get so open, etc., they deviate from the natural path, so they want things which are different. So when they get so much used to it, having heterosexuality, they start homosexuality. It is not genetic, it is based on the things which you do, unnatural things, psychologically, you want something different, then you go to homosexuality. So if you stop this deviation from the path which is given guidance in the Quran and the other religions, what do you realize? This will stop. And I remember I'd been to Canada in 1996, first time, a man kissing a man. And Canada has legalized marriage of gays. Now, all this is coming because they're deviating from the truth. And today, psychologists tell us that a person who has no extramarital sex enjoys the best married life. You deviate from your normal thing, and this is what happens. So that is the reason if you follow the commandment of Almighty God, all these things will not happen. Therefore, in Islam, homosexuality, gays, lesbianism, everything is prohibited. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the next question? Yes. On behalf of the audience here today, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Zakir Nair and earlier your son Farid and the organizer for uh, bringing us this uh, enlightened uh, lecture. And I'm very happy to see you today in person. Uh, and I much uh, also believe in what you say about peace and harmony. And I think today's topic about women's rights and universal brotherhood is very timely. Yeah, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, I just want to... There are so many things which I agree with you. And I suppose the main essence is, uh, like what you said in the beginning, you know, should we, adherence of the major faith uh, religion in this world, if we uh, are the learned one, that means we truly understand the essence of the original spirit of all the major religions, then we will come to a common point where, be it what terminologies you use, whether it's a God, it's Allah, it's a Dharma, or it actually, in essence, it actually meant the one and only. Right. So if we could agree with that, then uh, interfaith dialogue would actually open the way for peace and harmony, and there would not be any uh, sort of things like, you know, differentiation, but more of diversity in harmony. Yeah, and I think one of my, um, uh, by the way, my name is Richard. I'm an executive recruiter. For me, although I'm born a Buddhist, but I study Islam, and I, if someone say I'm a Muslim, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, and if someone say I'm a good Christian, I'm proud of it as well, because uh, my favorite verse in the Quran is uh, in Maeda, verse 48. I think it states very clearly that, you know, what is more important is the good work that we do, right? It's not so much, uh, uh, because if God has so willed, He has made us a single people, right? That's why He makes us a lot of religion, right? But He just want to try us and test it in what He gives us. But actually, all our ultimate goals uh, go back to God. And if there's any differences like we have today, if we refer back to the scriptures, whether it's the Quran or whether it's the Bible or whether it's the sutras in Buddhism or whether it's the Vedas, we will find that actually um, 
it refers to the same thing that you, you mentioned earlier. I have two questions which is related. Uh, first is regards the woman's right. I think about uh, interfaith marriage actually. Um, if from the Quran, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I think one of the words is Ma'edar uh, verse 5, where it stated that uh, lawful to you in marriage are actually the believers or the chaste women of the people of the book. Right? Um, but of course, uh, that will depend on whether you take the uh, literal interpretation or you take the uh, tafsir makasidi, either the usili or makasidi. If you take the literal, of course, some people would uh, actually come to the conclusions which is actually upheld by many of the uh, majority of the uh, Muslim government today, right? Uh, states that the Muslim man is allowed to marry women of the people of the book, but not vice versa, right? Because if literally it states only the chaste woman, it never said the chaste uh, man, right? If you look literal approach. But if you look at the Makassidi approach, which is the spirit of the law, and just now you talk about equality of the woman, and we know that uh, we have to look at the language of the day. Because those days, like we mentioned, mankind. Mankind refers to both men and women. This is the same thing we mentioned, chair, man. It actually can be a woman. That's why today we rather use humankind and chairperson. So, and because of the culture that day, of that time, most time is addressed to the male, but it meant the women as well. So if we were to interpret in that way, it would also suggest or meant to say that actually the women should be allowed to marry the men of the people of the book. So now the contention is what is the definition of people of the book, right? So the, of course, a lot of um, government, including in Malaysia here, I suppose uh, they take the, quite the strict interpretation, so much so that they claim there's no such thing as a pure people of the book. But I would like to lend your confidence in the sense that we find the common, the common grounds, the commonalities, right? In the sense that uh, if it's, this is a book, I will give it to you afterwards, right? This is a book by uh, Reza Shah Qasimi, a scholar under the Common Ground Initiative by Prince Jordan. And uh, it actually uh, contains a lot of uh, proof from the Quranic uh, verses. Uh, for example, uh, 87, uh, 19 which actually uh, conclude that uh, religion like Buddhism is also considered a uh, people of the world. So my question is that, in light of all these things, and also to... Brother, I've got a question, I've got a question. Okay, okay. You have posed two questions, cut it short. As the moderator said, if it's two sentences, if the question longer, then it becomes a speech. Okay, okay, so sorry, because you're, I thought... You're I thought basically, I, should, I've understood, okay. brother. The two questions I've asked, mainly dealing with marry the people of the book, Surah Maida chapter 5, verse number 5, and regarding can Buddhists be called the people of the book. Correct? Two questions. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so let me answer. Confirm. Okay, I just confirm. Don't ask one more question. No, no, no. This, I just, number, number one uh, is the women, Muslim women, uh, in light of the truth of the Quran, uh, uh, should be allowed to marry. I understood that. I got the question. No need of repeating. My okay. memory is, mashallah, very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. And before the question, you made a statement, I'll come in after my answer. Before you gave the two questions you asked, you made some statements, I'll comment that after I give the answer to it. Even that I remember. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Coming to a question that the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 5, that lawful for you on this day is the food of the Ahle Kitab and the women of the Ahle Kitab who are chaste. So based on this, a Muslim man can marry a chaste woman from the Ahle Kitab, but why then the vice versa not allowed? His interpretation is many a time when word is used, chairman, it includes even woman can be chairwoman. When you say mankind, it means humankind. Quran in Arabic language is the same. When they say for man, many a times, most of the times it's included, but not always. But not always. For example, if I say as a doctor, that a woman gives birth to a child. It's woman, it's not man. Many a times man includes women, but not always. Similarly, in the Arabic grammar, when you know the gist, yeah, you are nas. Nas is actually male. But when I translate, oh, humankind, I say. So in Arabic also, it's the same. When the male is referred to, female is included, but not always. And that you come to know by the context. In this verse, it does say, lawful for you to marry a woman of the Ahle Kitab. So women never include man in Arabic, never. 
When I say woman, it never includes man. When I say man, it can include woman. Do you understand? Do you understand or not? When I say man, many a times it can include woman. But when I say woman, it can never include man. Even in English language. When I say chairwoman, can it include chairman? No. When I say chairman, can be chairperson. When I say mankind, can be humankind. When I say woman, is right. does it be man's right? Does it mean? Okay. Okay, I Even in English language, when I say woman, a man will never be included. When I say man, many a time women are included. Though in the woman, the man is there. W-O-M-A-N. In writing, man is included in woman, but not in meaning. <laughs> when you write W-O-M-A-N, man is included in the woman, theoretically, but not practically. So same way in Arabic, whenever the gender male is used, many a times it includes both, but never ever when female is used, man is included. Coming? Now coming to the point, what is the reason? So your logic cannot be applied here in any language. Neither English, neither Arabic, neither Chinese also, hopefully. Okay, now coming to the logic. You have to ask me why and I'll give you the answer. The reason is, first of all, I differ with the majority of the scholars on this statement about women allowed. That we'll discuss later. I'll come to your main point why man is allowed to marry a woman, but why not a Muslim woman allowed? The reason is that when a man marries a woman, the woman leaves the house and comes to the man's house, normally. Now, if you marry a L.A. Kitab, Jews and Christians, the Christian believes in all the prophets from Adam up to Jesus, peace be upon him. We tell the Christian, you believe one more, that's Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we as Muslims cannot degrade any prophet of the Christians. What we say? From Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Isaac, Jesus, we believe in all, peace be upon them all. We say believe in one more. So the woman who comes from the Christian family to the Muslim family, she's not hurt, she has to believe in an additional prophet. If a Jewess comes, she believes in all the prophets from Adam, peace be upon him, Moses, peace be upon him. We say believe in two more, Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them. It's easy. Now, if I take the vice versa, if a Muslim woman goes to a Christian man's home, that Christian doesn't believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Though he should, according to the Bible, he does not. So when she goes to a Christian house, she will be insulted. Do you understand? I understand your point, uh, Dr. Zakir Naik. I have not, uh, not I... completed my answer yet. Okay, 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 okay. carry on. Sorry. Yeah. So here, because of that, if a Muslim woman goes, she will not be allowed to follow Islam. So that's the reason one way is allowed for a LA Kitab woman to come is allowed, but for a Muslim woman to go is not allowed. I further disagree with the majority of the scholars. This verse of the Quran of Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 5 says, lawful for you, the food of the LA Kitab, and the women of the LA Kitab who are modest. But there's one more verse in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 221, which says, that you cannot marry an idolatress until she believes. A believing woman, even if she's a born woman, is much better than an idolatress, even if she allows you. She may be a beauty queen. She may be the richest woman in the world. She may be the most beautiful woman in the world. To marry a slave woman who's a believer, who's a Muslim, is far superior to marry an idolatress, even if she allows you. And the verse continues, that do not marry an idolater until he believes. A slave man who's a Muslim, is a believer, is far superior to idolater, even if he allows you. He may be the most handsome man in the world. He may be the richest man in the world. A slave man who's a believer is far superior. This is the verse of the Quran. Now one more verse of the Quran of Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72 says, Lakat kafr kalu. They are doing kufr, those who say that Jesus, son of Mary, is Allah. They are doing kufr. So one verse of the Quran says you can marry from the LA Kitab, who are modest. One verse of the Quran says you cannot marry those who do kuf, those who do shirk. Another verse of the Quran says, Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 70 to 73, that they are doing kuf. Those who say Jesus, son of Mary, is Almighty God. Based on this, you cannot marry a LA Kitab girl who says that Jesus is God. Who can you marry? The answer is given in Surah Al Imran chapter 3 verse 110. Those who 
It says that, oh, ye Muslims, they are the best of people evolved for mankind. Enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. And the verse continues. If the people of the book had faith, it would have been better for them. Among the Ahle Kitab, there are some who are believers, who are Mu'min. But the majority of Fasik people are transgressors. So according to me, there cannot be a contradiction in the Quran. When the Quran says you can marry women from the Ahle Kitab, one verse says you cannot marry those who do shirk for associate partners with God. One verse says that those who say Jesus is God are doing shirk. But one verse says, there are among Ahle Kitab who are Mu'min. That means today there are certain Christians, they are called Unitarian, not Trinitarian. Majority of the Christians are Trinitarian, they believe in Triune God, which is not allowed in Quran. salasa. Don't say Trinity. This is probably better for you. Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171. According to me, you can only marry those just girls who are Jews and Christian, who don't do shirk, who don't believe Jesus is God and believe in one true God. Not any Mary, Sheila, anyone. So I differ with the majority because I'm a student of comparative religion. The majority of the scholars say you can marry any girl from Ahle Kitab. I say no, you can only marry that Ahle Kitab who's a Mumin. Otherwise there will be a contradiction. So I believe only those Ahle Kitab, those girls, those women who believe in one God and don't believe Jesus is God. Based on that, I differ. And as I told you, does allow a man to marry a L.A. Kitab who believes in one God, but does not allow the vice versa because that girl, when she goes to a Christian or a Jewish house, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be degraded. They don't believe in it. So how can you continue? You can't continue having a vehicle, one tire of a tractor and one of a bicycle. Coming to your question, that you posed earlier, that I am happy to say I'm Muslim, I'm happy to say I'm a Christian. It sounds good, but for a person who has knowledge, it sounds contradictory. See, when I said, if Christian means following the teachings of Jesus Christ, I am more Christian than the Christian themselves. But normal terminology of Christian means a person who worships Christ. Tell it. The normal terminology, majority of the Christians, they say that Jesus is God. So you say, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, it contradicts. The moment you say Jesus is God, you can't be a Muslim. So that's the reason when you use words, if you know what does it mean. If you say Christian means following teachings of Christ, that means you're a Muslim only. But if you say Christian means the person who worships Christ, you can never be a Muslim. You can't say, I have got 10 rupees. And then tomorrow you will say that I have got more than 100 rupees. I'm in the original spirit. I don't believe Jesus is the son of God. Correct. That means you're not like a normal Christian. Very good. Then if you say you're a Muslim, I can accept you. Very good. That's the reason when you do comparative religion. I'm very careful. When I say I'm a Hindu, geographically I'm a Hindu. At the same time I say, if you say Hindu is a person who do idol worship, I'm not a Hindu. I make it clear. I don't try and butter everyone. You understand? So same way if you say you're a Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to God, who believes there's one God, who believes that God has got no image, who does not believe in idol worship, and who believes Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. Brother, do you believe there's one God? Yes. Do you believe God has got no image? Yes. Do you believe idol worship is wrong? Yes. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger? I mean, uh, according to the Quran, it states so. Yes. So I, I, do I you believe, believe? In, that, in that same point, I believe. Allah, so if you believe yeah. that God is one, and if you believe idol worship is wrong, and if you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, then you are a Muslim. Then you qualify to be a Muslim. You can become more and more practicing later on. But if you agree with the basic, these two things are basic required for a person to enter Islam. After that, the other practices will come slowly and slowly. So if you agree there is one God, and if you say idol worship is wrong, and if you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, you are a Muslim. And then I agree with you when you said that Jesus is not God, then I surely agree with you that you can be qualified to be called a Muslim. That, that, that's what I meant when I say I, I, agree with I, you. I, I want to be a good Muslim. Very good. Good Very good. When I say I, I can be a good Christian. Following the I teaching, meant, the true teachings of Jesus. Yes, like yes, me, like yes. me. Very yes. good. I'm with you. Even yes. I want to be a good Christian. Yeah. What, what I meant, that, that is why I take the trouble to go into some background just to clarify that, you know, we have to uh, encourage everyone to go back Correct. to the original spirit and the truth Correct. of this 
all the religious texts, not, would... not the majority of what the followers Very good, very believe. good. If you want... majority... Very good, I agree with you. Think incorrectly. I agree with the majority, yeah. not always right. I agree with you. You have to follow the scripture, not the church. Yes. Brother, now what you said in English, that I'm a Muslim, etc. Would you like to say it in Arabic? No. Would you like to say it in Arabic that there's one God and Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God? No. I think uh, just to borrow the words of Prof. Tariq Ramadan, he says very... Uh, Sorry? Professor Tariq Ramadan. Prof. Tariq Ramadan. Yeah, yeah. I happened to attend one of his sessions. I think he said very correctly. He said he has no problem with Islam, but only some Muslim. He has no problem with other religious texts, no Bible or sutras or Vedas in the original form, just like you, you said, you know, right? They believe in the one truth Correct. or one yes. God. But it's the, the followers, the majority of them right now. Correct. Know? Same thing. Yeah. I'm not here to defend the Muslims. Every community of black sheep, I'm here to talk about Islam. And when you want to follow Islam, don't look at the Muslim, look at the Quran. Yes, correct. But I'm asking you that once you believe there is one God, and you believe that idol worship is wrong, and you believe that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God, this is basic to gain entry into the school. Entry into the school first standard. Then you may become second, third, fourth later on. What I'm asking you, would you like to admit yourself to the school of Islam? Uh, Dr. Zakir Knight, uh, based on verse uh, 48, uh, Ma'ida, I think uh, Allah or God has made it so clear that it's, it is not His will. You know, He said, if, if, if I had so will, I'll make you a single people, but that's not His plan. So, in other words, uh, no, Allah no, no. knows best. And no, that's all not knowing, His plan. That's not that one, that so verse of the Quran, if He wanted, He could have made everyone believe. Then, where is the test? If the teacher says, I, if I want, I can pass everyone, then no one will study. So Allah is telling, for him to make everyone believe is very easy. But because this is the test, as I quoted the verse of Surah Mul, chapter 67, verse number 2, Allah di khalaq al wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. If he makes everyone believe, then where is the test? He's already created that creation, the angels. The angels always follow Almighty God. But the human beings, with giving of free will, if they follow Allah's commandment, they are superior to the angels. If after free will they disobey, then they go lower than the angels. In this aspect, I would rather interpret this passage as a differentiation between the people of the book and the Mushrikuns. That means idolaters. I haven't come to your second question yet. People of the book. <laughs> okay. okay. Your question of people of the book, I haven't come to it yet. Yeah. That's your second question. Okay. I answered your first question and I've given comments on can... what you spoke before asking the question. The people okay. of the book haven't come to it yet. Okay, can, can, I, can I just uh, uh, sum up on two common points that we share in common? Number one, I think you, you agree uh, that uh, most of the time, if not all the time, when Quran or any other text that we see, you know, in those uh, culture, language culture, even today, you know, when you talk about a man, it will also include the women, right? But that answer I gave you now, brother. Yeah. Again, you're coming back to the same question. Did you forget no, my no, answer? No, 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 no. I agree. I just want to confirm. But when some... you say woman, the man is not included. I mean, uh, um, allow me to, to go a little bit further. I have uh, not answered your second question. You're asking me a third question. Because the... The moderator yeah, told one question at a time. First, you gave a speech, which I had to comment on. Then you asked first question. Then you asked second question. I have not answered the second question. You're asking me third question. Uh, that is okay. Please Brother, don't, I don't, to, get, I would, don't get me wrong. I'm not what, getting you wrong. I'm getting question, you right. But the moderator said one question at a time. Go yeah. behind the queue. I will answer your second question. I would love to answer. I'll be here. Even if everyone goes, I'll be here. I promise you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank but you let so me much. answer your second question. You can but, go behind the other non-Muslim. I'll be but, here. I will not leave. But the first question, uh, can I... I yet have to answer the second question of yours. Oh, but... So uh, don't you want the answer for that? Oh. Are the Buddhist L.A. Kitab? I have not answered that. Did you get the answer? Did I answer? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay. I can understand your standpoint. I have about... not yet given the answer. How can you understand? Can you read my mind? Great, you I have Sorry, not Dr. Zakir Nai. I have not started my answer on L.A. Kitab. Dr. Zakir Nai. That is, I'm referring to the first uh, answer that you gave to my first question. So you have spoken. So I think I know what you said. Because all the audience know what you said. So, so of can... the first answer. Second answer, where have I given? Uh, because the first answer, I beg to defer in certain areas. So can you allow me to, to, to give my viewpoints? I mean, the, to be, uh, yeah, at, two at the end of the queue. I'd love at the end of the queue. I'll give the second answer, then go behind the queue. I would love. But then there are about 7, 8,000, 10,000 people here. 4,000 in the auditorium, 6,000 outside. So you can go behind the queue. I'll just give the answer to your second question. 
The second question you pose that can we consider the Buddhist to be Ale Kitab? Ale Kitab in Arabic means people of the book. Kitab means book. Kitab also means revelation. It can be people of the revelation. In that way, even we have a book. Even the Muslims are Ale Kitab. But the terminology used in the Quran, Ale Kitab specifically refers to Jews and Christians and no one else. Ale Kitab is a word meaning people of the book, but in context of the Quran, it only refers to Jews and Christians. We have many prophets, but when the Quran says, Oh Prophet, tell your wives and the believing woman, it means only one prophet, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So if you know the language, you can understand that when the Quran says, Oh Prophet, do this, it is only referring to the last and final Prophet Muhammad and not the earlier prophets. Similarly, Ale Kitab means people of the book, even Muslims are people of the book. In, in definition. But when Quran says Ale Kitab, it does not refer to Muslims. It only refers to Jews and Christians. So at the time of the Prophet, this idiom, Ale Kitab, was only used for Jews and Christians, no one else. There are many other people who have got revelation. There are many other religions which have got book. But in the Quran, it refers to only Jews and Christians, no one else. It's very clear cut. If you know, if you it depends, know, Dr. Zakir Nair, because if you read the commentary by uh, our learned Prof. Hashim Kamali, forget about commentary. I'm talking about the text. I'm talking depends, about the text. You're talking about commentary. It depends on how commentary. you interpret. It depends how you interpret. Whether you interpret I'm it using the, the literal or using the I'm Makassi. giving the interpretation of the Quran. If you say, "Yeah, Ale Kitab, come to comment term," that means all Muslim come to comment term. What does it mean? If I say you can marry a woman from the Ale Kitab, Ale Kitab are Muslims also. So that means you cannot marry a man from Ali Kitab. Man is Muslim also. So that's the reason. If I use your logic, there will be contradiction in the Quran. So yeah, which that's... commentary you are following, I don't know. The commentary should match with the text of the Quran. If the commentary doesn't match with the text of the Quran and gives you a different meaning, you reject that commentary. This is my answer for the next question. You can go behind the queue. Okay, before I, before I go, just the last... Please go just behind the, the queue, please. Please yeah, go behind the queue. To... I will inshallah answer. I will stay here. As long as you stay, I will stay here. Okay. I'll stay till morning also. Till morning. Okay, we have a private session afterwards. Not okay. private, stand behind the queue. Can we have the next question? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Preet. I'm a non Muslim. Oh. I'm of a Sikh religion. And um, I came across Islam like a year and a plus back through a friend. We are studying in the same university. And he introduced Islam to me. He gave me a couple of books to read because I used to look at the way he was practicing Islam. He used to pray and his talks, the way he used to talk to me. And then after some time, uh, I used to ask him a lot of questions. So he told me, why don't you read the Quran in the translated version? So that's what I did. So uh, I was pretty convinced after I read the Quran that Allah is the only true God and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the only is the last messenger. But after some time, my parents came to know about it, and they are very religious. So they are very unhappy that I was um, diverting into another religion. So they decided to take me to the temple to renew my faith. Despite the fact that I was um, not very happy, I could not object them because they would scold and like raise their voice, and I didn't want to fight with them. So I just agreed, but I did not do it from my heart. I just did it to make them happy, to please them, to avoid any argument and all that. So now I actually want to ask you for an advice. What do I do? How am I supposed to convince my parents? How am I supposed to tell them that I believe this is the religion for me at least? Sister asked the question that she had been studying Islam since the past one and a half year. And she liked the teaching, she read the Quran, she got convinced that there's one God and Prophet Muhammad is a messenger. And later on, when the parents came to know, they took her back to the temple. And though she unwillingly had to obey the parents, she's asking, how can I convince my parents? There is a talk I've given in this book of mine, Concept of God in Major World Religions. Here what I spoke was only of four religions, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. If you see my full lecture, it even includes Sikhism. Sikhism. Sikhism, sister, is a religion which came towards the end of the 15th century in the land of Punjab. It was found by Guru Nanak Sahib. And what the scholars say, it's an amalgamation of many of the teachings. 
from Hinduism and Islam. And it's the religion of ten gurus. And if you read the concept of God in Sikhism, if you read the text, not the practice, the text, if you read Guru Granth Sahib, if you read the first chapter, Adi Granth, the first verse is known as Japuji. It says that he is true, he is not begotten, and he is most powerful, free from all wants, and has power over all things, and there is nothing like him. So this of Japuji matches very closely with Surah Ikhlas, which I said. So theoretically, Sikhism definition of Almighty God is quite similar to definition of Quran Surah Ikhlas. That is the reason what Sikhs believe. They believe in, they give two names, Omkara, which has a manifest form, and Ek Omkara. And there are various attributes given to Almighty God in Sikhism. They call Almighty God as Sahib, which means Lord. They also call him as Rahim, merciful. They call him as Kareem, beneficent. They call him as Vahe Guru, one true God. And Sikhism is against idol worship. It's against Autarvada, Almighty God taking forms. It's even against idol worship. So the teachings of as far as concept of God is concerned, theoretically is quite similar. Practically, they do deviate here and a little bit. But otherwise, as far as concept of God is concerned, it is quite similar. What my advice to you would be, you can give the translation of the Quran even to your mother and father. And ask them to read. And tell them that, can you point out something which is not good? Or something which disagrees. So you have to be patient. And you have to tell them. And you have to do the duty of a true believer. First, I would like to know that you did say that you read the Quran. And you did also say that you believe in one God. But you never said whether you accept Islam or not. But by believing there is one God, believing idol worship is wrong, believing in Prophet Muhammad you do enter into the fold. But whether you did accept or not, I'm not aware. I would like to ask you, sister, that would you like to accept Islam? Yes, I would like to, but at this moment, I would want to think, like, want to know how am I supposed to convince my parents first? Because I don't want to do something like they are not of the knowledge. And I told my parents that if I'm going to take any step, I will inform you. You will be informed before I take any step. That's right. So what I would request you, as I told you, that you can give my DVDs to your parents. There are various DVDs. And I know that so much of misconception there about Islam that most of the non-Muslim would get afraid. Oh, you're becoming a Muslim. That means you're becoming a terrorist. No, you're going to follow religion of terrorists. You're going to violence. In fact, I always recommend that anyone who becomes a Muslim, especially the youngsters, first thing I tell them that there should be a difference between your behavior, what you did before accepting Islam and after accepting Islam. And as my son Farik, he told in his lecture, that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. Even for you, sister, your paradise, even if your mother is a non-Muslim, paradise is there beneath the feet of your mother. Whether your mother goes to paradise or not is secondary. You understand, na? Because you have to love your mother, you have to respect your mother, that does not mean that if you become a Muslim, if you become, you have to disrespect your mother. So when your parents see the change, that fine, I used to request my daughter to do small things she never used to do. Now she's helping me, she's dabbing me, she's following my instructions. So you have to see that once you become a Muslim, there has to be a marked difference between your behavior, what was earlier and what was now. If previously you were a good daughter, now you have to be a better daughter. And when they ask you why, you say, this is the teaching of the Quran, this is the teaching of the Prophet. So once they find a marked difference in your behavior, in your kindness, in your obedience, if you are following 50%, try and follow 99.9 or 100%. If you are following 90%, try and follow 100%. Only those things, what they tell you, which goes against the teaching of the Quran and teaching of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, those are the only things you should abstain from. Besides that, all what she tells you, even though you may not like it, you should do, so there should be a marked difference. For example, they may tell you, okay, wear clothes which are blue, and blue is not a favorite color. So if blue is not a favorite color, if your mother likes it, wear it. So she gets happy. You have to look after her, you have to care for her more, so that they should be forced to ask, how come this change is there? So once they are forced to ask you how the change is, because these are the teachings of the Quran. 
and that's what my son told in his lecture, what I gave a gist. So this is their system. At the same time, you have to try and remove the misconception. I've written a book on the most common questions asked by non-Muslims. That book, I think it will be available outside. I request the volunteers to give a copy to her. And these normally try and clarify the misconception what the media has spread about Islam. So if you give that book to read to your mother and father, maybe they will understand part of it, if not completely, and give the translation. And what I would say that never disrespect your parents. Even if they do things which are wrong, you as a daughter should not disrespect. As the Quran says, you can't say oof to them also. But same time, only those things what they tell you which is against Allah and His Rasul, these two things, is the only time you can disagree but politely. All the other things you go out of the way to convince them and to be good to them, be kind to them, there should be a marked difference. And then inshallah, they will be happy. Initially, they would feel a bit sad because, but natural, they would think that you're going into a wrong religion. But later on, because of her behavior, they'll get convinced, and you never know, you may be the zariya for the Jannah. Like your mother, paradise said, beneath her feet, maybe you may be the zariya, you may be the path which will lead your parents to paradise. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have questions from Mike One, please? Uh, good evening, doctor. Uh, my name is Chong Nin. I'm a student uh, from IUKL. So I have two questions actually, but I'll ask the second one if the organizer permits later. So my first question is, okay, uh, just now in your talk earlier, you were talking about uh, brotherhood uni unity. So it sounds like a potential solution for religious harmony between uh, the many major faiths in this world. So the, big, the uh, biggest problem I, I think about is like uh, Christianity, there are many different sects, different religious, uh, I mean, David, uh, different uh, sections, different interpretations by preachers and humans. So, based on this human factor that tends to misinterpret a religion, uh, deviating from the main uh, text, the main content of a religion, what is your solution or your response to this uh, problem or to this biggest obstacle to brotherhood unity? But that's a good question that we find in some religion, and I give the example of Christianity, that people interpret the scripture differently, therefore you have different sects, etc. And that's what brings diversity, so what is the solution? Whether the solution is that you go back to the scripture, and if the interpretation differs, and by the different interpretation, if there's a contradiction, then you choose that interpretation which there's no contradiction. For example, you just heard, the earlier brother, when he asked that, why can't a man from Ali Kitab marry? And everyone agrees that you can marry from women from Ali Kitab. So I gave my reasoning that if I believe that you can marry any Ali Kitab, Mary, Sheila, so there will be a contradiction in the Quran. Because one verse of the Quran says you cannot marry a mushrika. And people who worship Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, are doing shirk. That's what the Quran says. So I come up with an answer in which there is no contradiction. So any logical person who hears both the answers will agree with my answer more or any answer in which there is no contradiction. Same with the earlier person who says, I believe Jesus is son of God. So if you believe Jesus, peace be upon him, is son of God, Adam is son of God, Ephraim is son of God, Israel is son of God, do you give the same status as Jesus? He says no. So people say something but they don't mean it. So when there is a difference in interpretation, I say then why do you give so much respect to Jesus and not to the other prophets? What they are saying actually begotten son. And when they say begotten, I say that word has been removed from the Bible. So when you study, when you do an analytical study, analogical study, you come to the truth. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon said in the Bible, seek the truth and truth shall feed you, Gospel of John. So when you're doing research, you easily come to know which is the correct one. But if you follow blindly the church or a particular scholar, blindly without checking right or wrong, then you come into a problem. So that is the reason when you read a commentary of any scripture, what you have to see how logical it is and how well it is connected. And you have to take the scripture as a whole, not only one verse out of context. If you take one verse out of context and interpret it, you have to take the scripture as a whole. So when you take as a whole and that commentary which fulfills the requirement is the correct one. 
So this has to be done with study, brother. And then you realize that which is the correct translation and interpretation of the scripture. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Do you have any other question? You uh, said you had two questions. Yes, but then if the organizer okay. has enough time? No, because we allowed the others, I would give the same thing to you, brother. Okay, so this is just a short question. So, so early on you were talking about uh, Muslim sh uh, should not pray towards an idol or object or anything because God is formless and He is beyond our comprehension. So, from my understanding, from just my, uh, what I've observed, it, I probably believe it's wrong, but when the Muslims perform their pilgrimage at Mecca, the direction of prayers are facing towards a stone pillar in the center. So, what is, uh, isn't this contradicting to what? Very good question. Earlier? The brother asked a very good question that if Islam is against idol worship, I did not say God is formless, I said God is imageless. There's a difference between formless and imageless. If you interpret your way, there'll be a big, big blunder. I said God is imageless, I never said God is formless. There's a difference between formless and imageless. Coming to your main question, that if Islam is against idol worship, when you go to pilgrimage and you bow down toward the Kaaba, isn't it same as idol worship? And this is there in my book, the most common question. It is number nine. The ninth most common question asked by non-Muslims about Islam is, if Islam is against idol worship, why do you bow down to the Kaaba when you pray? And the answer is, no Muslim ever worships the Kaaba. The Kaaba is our Qibla, it's the direction. Because we Muslims believe in unity. For example, today all the Muslims want to offer salah, want to pray here. Some may say let's face north, some will say south, some will say east, some will say west. There will be disunity. So for unity, wherever you are, you face towards the Kaaba. This is the verse of the Quran of Surah Bakra, chapter number 2, verse 144, which says that when you pray, face towards the Kaaba. So Kaaba is the Qibla, it is not we worship it. Furthermore, Muslims were the first people who drew the world map. And al udrisi in 1154 was the first human being who drew the world map. When the Muslims drew the world map, South Pole was on top, North Pole down, Kaaba was in the center. The Western cartographers came and they turned the map upside down. North Pole top, South Pole down, yet Kaaba is in the center. So if you stay in the north, you face towards the south. If you stay in the south, you face towards the north. If you stay in the west, you face towards the east. If you stay in the east, you face towards the west. Kaaba is the center of the world. When people go for Umrah, when Muslims go for Umrah, or we go for Hajj, we circumambulate around the Kaaba. What is the reason we circumambulate? Because it's a commandment of Almighty God. But logically what I can think, that every circle has got one center. When we circumambulate around the Kaaba, we are testifying that there's only one God. And the statement of the second Khalifa of Islam, Hazrat Umar, he said it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, in the book of Hajj. Chapter number 56, Hadith number 675, Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, the second caliph of Islam, he said that this black stone can neither benefit me, can neither harm me. I'm kissing it only because I've seen the Prophet kiss it. This statement that the black stone can neither benefit me or neither harm me is sufficient to prove that Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. And lastly, at the time of the Prophet, there were Sahaba who stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. No idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol he or she worships. So this proves that no Muslim ever worships the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla, it's only a direction. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, so we have time to take just one more question. So please go ahead, brother. Hi, my name is Ivan and uh, welcome to my beautiful country. I'd like to know your thoughts on Quran only Muslims, why they reject the Hadith, and how do they practice the religion without referring to the Hadith? Brother asked the question that there are Muslims who follow the Quran and reject the Hadith. And how can they follow Islam without practicing Hadith? If you follow the Quran, there are no less than 20 places the Quran says, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. If you follow the Quran, you have to follow the Hadith. If you don't follow the Hadith, you can't follow the Quran. Many places, including Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 59, says, Atiullah, Atiur Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So if you want to follow the Quran, you have to follow the Hadith. Quran is a telegraphic message. Many a time for details, you have to go to the Hadith. Quran says, give zakat. How much to give? You find in the Hadith, 2.5%. Quran says, offer salah. Something is mentioned, not details, you go to the Hadith. So anyone who says that only follow Quran will not follow Hadith, 
he cannot practically follow the Quran. Because Quran says, obey Allah and obey the messenger. So you cannot be a practicing Muslim until you follow Quran and the authentic hadith, the sayings of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. Okay, one last question. Uh, with so many school of thoughts in Islam, can you tell me what happened to Isa? Why the Jews wanted to kill him? Sorry, I didn't understand. What did you say? What did can you tell me what happened to Isa? Isa al Islam. Isa, yeah. Jesus, Jesus huh? Why the Jews wanted to kill him and who was put in replacement of him? The brother asked the question that why did Jews want to kill Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him? Who was replaced and what happened to him according to the Quran? The reply is given in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 157. It says, وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّ قَتَلَ الْمَسْيُّ إِسَ بْنَ مَرْيَمَ They said in both the Jews that we killed Jesus, son of Mary. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا صَلَبُهُ They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It was made to appear so. وَلَكِنْ شُبْ بِعَلَوْمْ All those who differ are full of doubts. إِلَّا تِبَا زَنْ With only conjectures to follow. وَمَا قَتَلُهُ يَخِينَا For a surety they killed him not. So Quran says they did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. It was made to appear so. All those who differ are full of doubt. And then the next verse, Surah Nisa chapter 4, 150, it says, Allah raised him up alive unto himself. So according to the Quran, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not killed, he was not crucified. You asked him who was put in his place, I don't know. I know there are stories, Judas was put, this was put, Gospel of Barnabas. Quran says he was not killed, he was not crucified, for me it is sufficient. Who was put in his place, whether someone was put, I'm least bothered. Because Quran says anyone who differs is full of doubt. So even according to the Bible I've proved, I had a debate, was Christ really crucified? And from the Bible I've proved that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. But that will take time, you can refer to my video cassette. So from the Bible also you can prove Jesus wasn't crucified, peace be upon him. And even the Quran says he was not killed, he was not crucified, he is raised up alive. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he will come back again. According to the Quran, according to the Bible. Any second coming, he will testify to the Christians. As Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 116, that I never told you to worship me, but I said, Oh, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakul, my Lord and your Lord. Same thing is mentioned in the Bible. Any second coming, he will tell to the Christians that you depart from me, I don't even know you. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, has been raised up alive because people insinuated that he claimed divinity. Any second coming, he will testify. He never claimed to be God and he will come as the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Can we have the next question from the mic over the other side? Please post your name and your profession. A very good evening, doctor. My name is Reva and I'm a psychology student as well. The 9-11 question was from my sister. <laughs> But I'm not talking about 9-11, I have a separate question. And I'm having a sore throat, so I'll make the question quick before I run out of my voice. Well, I actually, I went to a Christian school. And there I'm surrounded by a very good number of narrow-minded people. And they are, their narrow-minded people's beliefs are anything except for Christianity is devil worship. So according to them, everything is devil worship. And for them, Islam is as well as devil worship. But I don't see it that way because if this is devil worship, it won't be the number one religion in the world. So, <laughs> clearly there's something in Islam that Christianity doesn't have, which is why it's such a achieving and a very, a lot of people are in it. So my question is, I want to know what that something is. So that's the question that she went to a Christian school, she was surrounded by Christians who she called narrow-minded. Here you're surrounded with broad-minded people, mashallah. So she says that Christianity says everything besides Christianity is devil worship. But she says that Islam is the fastest growing religion, maximum followers. So what is it, the in thing, that people are inspired towards? Sister, I've been in this field for Dawa for more than 20 years. More than 20 years I've been in this field of Dawa. And I've met many people who have reverted to Islam from Christianity, from Hinduism, from Buddhism, from Sikhism. And each one is inspired by different things. But the most common factor among the people who accept Islam in my survey is the belief in oneness of God. 
the other people theoretically say ek ishwar ek parmatma but practically they don't follow it christianity says believe in one god but they say father holy spirit and the son they talk about one but they practically believe in trinity so islam is the only religion which speaks and practices tawhid monotheism so this inspires a person about the one true god unity and unlike other religion where you can see that you know god fighting among themselves one god is taking the help of another god and the devil can defeat the god so all these things a normal person thinks is illogical how can god be defeated how can god die in some religion god dies also so if god dies who rules the world so when you see all these things logically people normally blindly follow these blind beliefs are not there in islam therefore quran says that do you not understand this is for men of understanding even in my talk i said that god almighty made the heavens and the earth and made in colors and languages verily it's a sign for those who understand quran is a book which convinces the logic in spite the media today being against islam you can imagine the power that the amount of billions and trillions of dollars they are pumping against islam to degrade it yet it is the fastest going religion so that's a miracle <laughs> allah says in the quran in surah imran chapter 3 verse 54 makru makrallah wallahu khairul makrin they plan and plotted allah to plan allah is the best of planners so in this way the major factor is that islam is the most logical religion there may be certain things which they may feel oh it's bad it's like that but when they come close to it like today today islam is malign one thing is terrorism second is that there are no women's rights if there are no women rights in islam today out of the americans accepting islam two third are women so why are the american women accepting islam out of the european accepting islam two third are women if islam is a religion and does not give rights to the women then who's forcing the european and american women to accept islam because they find the security they have been and seen the world and lived talking about liberalization and modernization they realize the real spirit is then the religion of islam so when they really practice some people may really get inspired okay because there's hijab bound to accept islam some people only hear the azan and they accept islam so people have different thing but the main thing the core factor is the tauhid so whatever they inspired by once they come to tauhid the oneness of god he is our creator he is our sustainer he is our cherisher which was the core factor of my talk today then and these people who accept islam they become more practicing than those people who are born in a muslim family sister do you believe there is one god yeah i do believe there is one god do you believe idol worship is wrong excuse me do you believe idol worship is wrong yes do you believe prophet muhammad is the messenger of god i want to so why don't you because i'm not inspired yet i want to be inspired <laughs> and nothing like inspiration if you say you want to if somebody is stopping you from myself i i want to be inspired i want to know that that is the truth and That's the only right. truth so maybe you coming to the lecture is not enough inspiration you coming to the microphone to ask this question is enough inspiration for you since you believe there's one god since you believe idol worship is wrong and if you believe in quran have you read the quran no i would request you to read the quran and if you read the quran you'll understand more about islam and i had given a talk yesterday muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the various world religious scriptures and i gave quotations of prophet muhammad mentioned in the hindu scriptures in the christian scriptures in the jewish scriptures in the buddhist scriptures only if you read since your background is hinduism i believe christianity christianity if your background is christianity have you read the bible yes it was a subject in my school fine i'll just give you the references prophet muhammad peace be upon him has been prophesized in the old testament and the new testament in the old testament he has been prophesied in the book of deuteronomy chapter number 18 verse number 18 in the book of deuteronomy chapter number 18 verse number 19 in the book of isaiah chapter number 29 verse number 12 in the song of solomon chapter number 5 verse number 16 for details you can refer to my video cassette he is also prophesied in the new testament in the gospel of john chapter number 14 verse number 16 in the gospel of john chapter number 15 verse number 26 in the gospel of john chapter 16 verse number 7 as well as gospel of john chapter number 16 verse number 12 to 14 i'll just give you one prophecy to make it short 
Jesus Christ peace be upon him said in the gospel of John chapter number 16 verse number 12 to 14 he said I have many things to say unto you but he cannot bear them now for he when the spirit of truth shall come he shall guide you unto all truth he shall not speak of himself all that he hear shall he speak he shall glorify me so this prophecy of Jesus Christ peace be upon him I have many things to say unto you but he cannot bear them now for he when the spirit of truth shall come he shall guide you unto all truth he shall not speak of himself all that dear shall he speak he shall glorify me this refers to no one but prophet muhammad peace be upon him because it says he shall not speak of himself all that dear shall he speak and you know the history of prophet muhammad peace be upon him that almighty god gave the revelation to prophet muhammad most of it through archangel gabriel whatever you got he repeated over with him and he shall glorify me if you see there is no messenger of god no person who claimed to be a messenger has ever glorified prophet jesus except prophet muhammad peace be upon him so it's mentioned in the bible that this man to come he will glorify me and all the other references i gave you it is pointing out to the coming of the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him and even the quran says it's mentioned in the quran in surah saf chapter number 61 verse number six that jesus christ peace be upon him was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel, to children of Israel, to the Jews. And he said, I give you glad tidings of a messenger to come whose name shall be Ahmad. And Ahmad is the second name of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not prophesied only in the Bible, Old and New Testament. He's even prophesied in the Vedas, in the Puranas, in the Hindu scriptures, in the Parsi scriptures, in the Buddhist scriptures. As I was saying earlier, that even though the scriptures have been changed, even if the scriptures have been manipulated yet, there are remnants in the verses of that scripture about the oneness of God, that's Tawheed, and about Prophet Muhammad being the last and final messenger. Uh, now, Doctor, since that I've never actually read the Quran, may I humbly request that can I have a translated version of the Holy Quran? Sure, inshallah. I request my I request my wife to hand over a translation of the Quran. She will inshallah hand over the translation. And I request you that please read the translation. And inshallah, if you have any question, you can either ask to a local DAW organization or you can ask to Islamic Information Services or you can write to us, email, it's a global village. You can send the email to islam at irf.net. IRF.net is the short form for the organization Islamic Research Foundation. And inshallah, we'll try our level best to clarify our doubts. Hope that's the Thank you, Doctor. Welcome. Do we have a question from this mic yeah, here? Sure. I just first like to say thank you for coming here. And my name is Puya. So I'm a student drama. And I come from Iran, not Iraq. Iran, the old name Persia. So I come from a religious family. My father, I mean, my family are Muslim. But I was born as a Muslim. But I didn't want to be born as a Muslim because, you know, so as a family I born. But still, I haven't accepted Islam because of some certain points. Uh, my main question was about, I mean, about the time, like Asian time, back to the thousand years ago, when the time the Islam come to my country and we became a Muslim. So as I read in the history and those kind of stuff, I found it out that the Arab countries, so they attacked to my country and they invade my country and they brought Islam by force. Without my king accepted. So Persia was the old country and it was the most civilized country from the Asian time until now. We believe a real God, we were worshiping a real God, and our religious was Zartosh. So he was a prophet also. So we believe in good things, good thought, good words. So even Cyrus the Great, he was the king of the world, and he was doing a lot of good things. Even some people, they was confused that they called him Masih or Masih. He was doing many good things, but he was never said, I'm a prophet, I'm a God. But even though that king, when he attacked the other country, he never killed the civilian, he never raped a woman, and he never made them to change the religion. Even somebody was worshiping a cow, he respect for them. Even though he was worshiping a real cow, he can, he can, he could make them to worship also the same as what is worshiping. But in the Islam way, if you are, if you're gonna promote your religion, doesn't mean that you have to force it to somebody else, or you have to make them to accept that religion, because you know human being means freedom. So anyone they should have a right, human rights. So maybe those people that didn't want it, that religion, so why they have to attack and, you know, to bring it by force? That was the main question that made my heart a bit, you know, 
to make me to my belief go down. So, Brother, are you Parsi? Pardon? Yeah, I'm from Fars. Fars. Are you a Parsi? You mean Farsi? Are you a Parsi? Are you a Zoroastrian? No, I, I'm not following any religion. You don't I'm belong not. to any religion. I don't. I don't believe. But you said your parents I, were. My parents were Muslim, but because of this confusion and stuff, I never try to follow the religion. I just believe in real God and doing the good things. So you believe so in I, real God and good things. What are the good things? Where do you get the good things from? Good things like I don't harm the others. Whatever I'm doing, not try to harm the others. That's the first thing. As much as you can do the good things, even helping the others and believe in the real God, not worshiping a stone or leaf or whatever. And I believe God is single, so, but I didn't... So you have myself. your own philosophy. <laughs> so you want to bring a new religion. <laughs> I'm not going to make any religion. I'm just following my brain because as I know, God gave us a brain. So I didn't make my mind busy by following the books. I always, when I was 10 years old, I was just thinking, thinking, thinking until now even. So I tried to... Just thinking, brain. thinking, he's saying, God, as long as not a stone. Who told you stone is not a God? Anyway, <laughs> I'll answer your, your basic question. Your basic question is that Muslims came to Persia and they conquered and they forced people to accept Islam so no one should force at all. I agree with you. Point to be noted is that today the media, the media, media promotes that Islam was fed by the sword. I am aware that there are certain black sheep in the Muslim community and there are certain Muslim rulers who did wrong things. But as a whole, Islam was never fed by the sword. Islam was never spread by the sword. It's spread by sword. Sword, sword. Sword. Sword means force. Force, yeah. Like you said, now Muslims came and conquered yeah, yeah. Persia, etc. You see everywhere it's happening. There are wars taking place. But in Islam, it's clearly mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 256. Like Rafid Deen, there's no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. What we see today, if we analyze that we Muslims, we Muslims, we were the lord of the Arab lands for more than 1400 years. For the past 1400 years, the Muslims were the lord of the Arab lands. For a few years, the Britishers came. For a few years, the French came. But overall, the Muslims were the ruler of the Arab land. Yet today, there are more than 9 million Christians who are Coptic Christians. That means they're Christians in generation. If the Muslims wanted, they could have forced each and every non-Muslim to accept Islam at the point of the sword. In the Arab land, these more than 9 million Coptic Christians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India for more than a thousand years. We ruled India for more than a thousand years. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim Indian to accept Islam at the point of the sword. Today, more than 80% of the Indians and non-Muslims. These more than 80% non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was spread by the sword. Which Muslim army has come to Indonesia? Indonesia today has the largest number of Muslims in any country, more than 200 million Muslims. In Malaysia, more than 55% of the citizens of Malaysia are Muslim. I am asking you, which Muslim army came to Malaysia? Your country, which Muslim army came? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? It was the business, it was the traders. When they came here, people accepted this religion. It is the media hype which talks about Islam was spread by the sword. Yes, there were a few people. There were a few black sheep of the Muslim community. Brother, you ask the question, you're listening or you're raising the hand? Okay, sure, sure. You ask the question, you give the background, I listen to it and now you want to raise your hand. I have not completed my answer. Okay, sure, continue. If you ask the question, you should think. Because if you're thinking something, I'm a doctor. If you're thinking, that means you don't hear my answer. If I ask you to repeat, you won't be able to repeat 25%. So when you listen, you should give attention. I'm a doctor. I've done psychology also. <laughs> so, this is the media hype. If you read Thomas Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle, historian, he writes in his book, Heroes and Hero Worship. He puts number one hero prophet as Prophet Muhammad He's a Christian. He says, if every new idea originates in one man's head, one man's head it dwells alone in the full world, it will do little good if he takes up a sword and propagates it. You have to first get your sword. He's talking about sword of intellect. There was a survey done in the Plainsuit magazine. 
a survey in the increase of the major world religions in a span of 50 years. In a span of 50 years, from 1934 to 1984, in a span of 50 years, the increase in the major world religion. It came in Dieter Digest, Almanac Year Book, 1984. Number one maximum increase in religion, it's Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I'm asking you, which war took place between 1934 and 1984, which forced the non-Muslim to accept Islam? Which war? Which war? Today, today, leave aside the past, today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I'm asking you, who's forcing the Americans to accept Islam? Who's forcing the Europeans to accept Islam? You were not there born. Were you present in the past? Arabs came to my land and forced. Where were you present? This is history. Many things in history is false. So Pro that's wait. what? Okay. Okay. <laughs> A very famous historian, Dilesse O'Leary, he writes in the book, Islam at the Crossroad, which number eight. He says, history makes it clear. History makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword, is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians ever repeated. Who says that? Dilesse O'Leary. History makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims Forcing Islam at the point of the sword over what conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians ever repeated. This is just in the media today. Muslim terrorist, Muslim terrorist. I am asking you, did any Muslim attack you in this country? No, never. But the media says Muslim the terrorist. Yeah, media is just nonsense. Yes, same way your history is also nonsense. <laughs> When media is nonsense, the history is also nonsense. Some is correct, some is wrong. That's the reason, if you hear the answer, I would like to end my answer with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson says that people worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. The bomb of peace. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Okay, thank you, doctor, for your answer. But the point is, I didn't get the right answer okay, because that's not media. That's history. And history is not something that can be written the false way. Because if it be written the false way, it can be changed. But that was the true history in all over the world and it's written every Brother, places. did you hear my quotation of Delacy O'Leary? Can you repeat it? Repeat what? Repeat Delacy O'Leary's quotation. I said it twice, not once, twice. Most but, of my answer was once. I said twice. Now repeat it. Repeat it to 50%. So what's the point of repeating that word? I want to know whether you, it went into your head or not. No, because that's what is in my head is, that is a history first thing. I'm media. asking you, can you repeat the statement, the answer which I gave earlier? If you cannot repeat that, means it's useless me repeating the answer. You're not listening to me. You're thinking something. No, I'm listening to you. You're can saying you repeat, that, that is major, can, that is Can false, you the repeat history. the statement of Delacy O'Leary, a very famous historian? No, I can't. I can. I'm saying it for third time. Listen. Listen to it and go behind the queue. <laughs> Delacy O'Leary says that history makes it clear. The legend of fanatical Muslims forcing Islam at the point of the sword over what conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. Delacy O'Leary says history has been telling falsehood. And you're saying history, I believe in history. Delacy O'Leary is saying that what history says that Muslims are forcing Islam at the point of the sword is the most fantastic myth that historians have repeated. So you have got influenced by the myth. So now think it's a myth and forget it and believe in the fact. The fact is you read the Quran and inshallah I want you to revert to Islam. Revert back to the religion of your parents inshallah. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. The last question for the night. Dr. Zakir Naich, uh, allow me to read to you about your comments about the people of the book only limited to the uh, Jews and Christians. This is a commentary by Prosh Hashim Kamali. I think he's quite an authority in Sharia. It's based on the words of the Quran. 
those who restrict the category of Ali Al Kitab to Jews sorry, and Christians. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What is the name you took? Which is the name of the famous sorry, sorry. person? You said because the, just now. What uh, was the name of the commentary? Who wrote it? Prof Hashim Kamali. Hashim Kamali. I haven't heard of him. First time I'm hearing. Yeah, please Google him. No, no. He's you said he's very famous. He's the chairman of uh, Institute of Advanced Islamic Study in Malaysia. Maybe famous in Malaysia. Yeah, yes, yeah. Maybe so uh, he may be. He may be good scholar. I'm not saying that. Yeah, I'll, pass you, I'll pass you his book. You can read. But yeah, right but now, just for the uh, benefit of I haven't of heard the... of him. He may be a good person. He may be a good scholar. I'm not disagreeing with that. But I personally haven't heard of him. Yeah, yes, no. you can read the commentary. Okay. Okay. This is based on the Quran. He says that those who restrict the category of Ali Al Kitab to the Jews and Christians quote in authority the Quran. Chapter 6, verse 156, which declares that books were revealed to two groups before. But the context where this phrase occurs actually questions rather than endorses the spirit of such limitation. Let us briefly examine the context. The verse, chapter 6, verse 156, immediately follows two other verses, one of which affirms the veracity of the Torah that contain guidance and light. The succeeding verse refers to the Quran itself has the blessed book, Kitabun Mubarakun, and an authoritative source. And then comes the verse, 6, 1, 5, 6. Lest you should say, bracket, thing, that books were sent down to two, bracket, groups of people, bracket, only, before us, and for our part, we remain unacquainted with a review book. The tone brother, of the discourse brother, here brother, is brother, expressive. Brother, all this doesn't make a difference. I'll give the reply again to you. All this doesn't make a difference to me. Even I'm a student of the Quran. Let me tell you one thing. I want to repeat the answer which you have not heard correctly. I told you by meaning Ali Kitab means people of the book. It can also mean people of the revelation. In that context, even Muslims are Ali Kitab. Allah has sent many books. Quran says in Surah Raj, chapter 13, verse number 38, the Kulli Ajlin Kitab. In every age, we have sent a book. That's the definition. But when Quran uses an idiom, Ali Kitab, it only refers to Jews and Christians, no one else. If I agree with that person, I don't know what context he's talking about, then there will be big chaos. Among the Ali Kitab, there are those who say this. And it says, Ali Kitab believe in law and gospel, meaning Torah and the Injil. With these, there are many verses in the Quran. With this, it is 100% sure that whenever Quran refers to LA Kitab, it only refers to Jews and Christians as an idiom. Otherwise, there are many other people who are LA Kitab. But when the Quran refers to it, and I give you the example, when Quran says, Oh Prophet, tell your wife and the believing woman. You ask me, who's a prophet? Adam is prophet. Noah is prophet. Abraham is prophet. Musa is prophet. Jesus is prophet. But when Quran says prophet, it specifically refers to no one but Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I gave you the answer. You didn't hear it. I hear you, but I hope this that is you the also... answer. I disagree because if I follow with that, there'll be contradictions in the Quran. I don't agree this contradiction in the Quran. Quran says, Ale Kitab, believe in Torah and the Injil. Now you will say, Buddhists believe in Torah and Injil. They cannot. Dr. Zakir and I, I, think, I think we should learn how to agree to disagree. Not agree to disagree. What you're yes. saying, if I agree with you, I have not, to believe I'm that... I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm just Brother, uh, I must sharing your view. I disagree with you. You shared the view. Imminent, of an imminent, uh, bud, uh, imminent Muslim scholars. There are many eminent people who can make mistakes. And there are many good scholars who have made mistakes. I don't disagree he's not eminent. I'm not saying he's not eminent. Okay, say... Where did I say... Abdullah... This Abdullah Yusuf Ali, which I quote, this Dr. Abdullah Yusuf Ali, brother, Ryan. brother, you want to keep on speaking? Have you come here to give a speech? This book, which I refer the translation, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, according to me, is the best translation available. There are mistakes in this also. Just because it's best, it doesn't mean because human beings are bound to make mistakes. I'm a human being, I can also make a mistake. But the point to be noted is when we do research, if we find one mistake, I don't reject everything because he then claimed to be God. This translation is one of the best translations. Even this translation has got mistakes. So what we have to realize that a human being cannot be perfect. So that person may be eminent, but I disagree with his interpretation. You and I disagree. So why are you coming and hopping again today? I've given you a reason why I disagree. What do you have to do? Okay, fine. This verse of the Quran interpret this way. You have to counter my argument. You're not counting, you're reading from the book. I, reading from the okay. book is a waste of time for us and for everyone. Because I give you quotation from the Quran which says about Ali Kitab and refers to Jews and Christians only.
This it's is talking also, about Torah. This is also from the Quran, and it states that actually you should have an open interpretation. And can I ask you a question, Dr. Zakir? Are you also a human? Of course I'm a human. So are you also bound to make mistakes? I can't make, but to prove I made a mistake, you have to prove where my mistake is. That, that, is why, <laughs> that, is, that is why I state to you from a commentary from an eminent Muslim scholar, but not have, from my own interpretation. But if that, but that about, eminent is not matching with the Quran. My interpretation, what I'm talking is based on the Quran. And majority of the scholars, majority Jumur scholars of Islam believe Ali Kitab means only Jews and Christians. There are so many Ibn Taymiyyah, I can name 20 or quoting one, which I have never heard of. Ibn Taymiyyah, you read Ibn Qasir, you read Tabari, all of them say Ali Kitab. What do you have to realize? I'm quoting Tabari, I'm quoting Ibn Qasir. All these top commentaries, all of them say that even Abdullah Yusuf Ali, even Abdul Majid Daryabadi, all of them say Ahle Kitab me Jews and Christians. Now you get what Malaysian fan, you may respect him, I've got no objection to that. Therefore, when you see, you have to give evidence. That evidence doesn't hold good for me. That's the reason I say that I believe in the commentary given by eminent, not one, hundred scholars, hundred. So when one is against hundred, if it has proof, if it's worth Considering, I consider. If it's not worth considering, I don't consider. If you want to believe in it, you have full right. No one can force you. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhirat dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. Thank you, Dr. Zakir Naik. We have come to the end of the session. I believe many of you have many more questions you'd like to ask, but time does not permit us. However, Dr. Zakir Naik's DVDs and VCDs are on sale outside the hallway. You can always get it there. Thank you very much. With this, I pass the session again to Brother Abu Sharis. Thank you, Brother Shahkirit. Unfortunately, we have come to an end of such an interesting and informative lecture from Dr. Zakir Naik, followed by a question and answer session. We do a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always give him the good health to continue his efforts in the field of da'wah and islah. With this, I'd like to conclude that I'm sure we all present here will agree with Dr. Zakir Naik in promoting universal brotherhood. With this, we end the event today. Wa akhiru da'wah, walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. شقيق الروح مني أخي